G'day ladies and gents, and welcome back to War Thunder. Today, we're going to have a look at a plane that requires a fair bit of patience to get off the ground, but once you do, it pays off in dividends. This is the Mustang Mark 1A, and this is a pre-Merlin version of the P-51. We have 20mm cannons to somewhat compensate, but at the end of the day, this is a very different beast to the Mustangs that we know and love. The P-51s have very, very strong engines, decent climb rates, and of course they have very good high altitude performance, whereas the Mustang Mark 1A has none of that. But before we get any further into the video, I'd like to tell you about today's video sponsor. This video is sponsored by Opera GX. Most browsers are boring, but not Opera GX. Opera GX is packed with features that genuinely enhance and customize your browsing experience, particularly for gamers just like you. Opera GX has unparalleled levels of customization, accessible through GX mods, where you can have everything from giving websites the Mexico filter to wallpapers. They even have the option for background music. Don't you feel nice and calm? Opera GX's GX control feature allows those with struggling PCs and internet connections to limit how much CPU, RAM, and internet bandwidth it uses, allowing you to watch YouTube content without causing in-game stuttering or packet loss for those with low-end systems. Opera GX also features popular social media integrations into the sidebar, allowing you to access apps like Messenger, Twitter, VK, Twitch, and Discord from the sidebar. I often use Messenger from the sidebar, and it is extremely convenient. Head down to the link in the description below, or scan the QR code on screen to download Opera GX for free and support an excellent long-term sponsor of the channel. Give it a try. You might just like it, just the same way that I did. By a fair long shot, the Mustang Mark 1A's best traits come from its guns. The 20mm Hispano cannons are the things that are going to make the plane for you. At 3.3, there are not many other planes that can withstand four 20mm cannons. And whilst the Hispanos are a little bit rubbish, I do have to admit, uh, at this battle rating, for some reason, they just tend to be really, really strong. That being said, you're on an airframe that is a little bit underpowered. The Allison engine leaves a lot to be desired. You don't have very good high altitude performance. And so you need to compensate for that because otherwise you're just gonna get turned into mincemeat. But ultimately there are other ways that you can make this plane work. There are other ways that you can turn this plane from an otherwise unremarkable dogfighter into something that is really, really powerful. You can turn it into one of the strongest boom and zoom planes at this tier. This P-63 is basically going to find out why. At this particular tier, you need to make sure that you have the high ground, because otherwise the enemies will be able to slaughter you. Now, this P-63 has found out the hard way that 20mm cannons are not good for the brain. So his engine is now on fire, he's now dead. This gives me free reign on the enemy planes. There are Fokker Wolves, P-63s, BF-110s, Corsairs, but it doesn't matter because I'm above them and I'm above them to such a significant degree that it doesn't really matter what I do. I'm almost always going to be able to beat them in a boom and zoom or I'm going to be able to energy trap them or I'm going to be able to do some absolutely ridiculous shit and get away with it. And that's the bonus of boom and zoom. You can pretty much get away with whatever you like, provided that you're putting yourself in the right situation and that there are no other planes above you. That's the key. Now this P-51 has learnt the hard way, it's kind of the same plane, but the way I've played the plane is completely different. It's so much better. You've gone for altitude, you've made sure that there are no enemies above you, you've gone for the enemies below you, and you have played your energy well. Now I kind of blunder it a little bit here, I'm just sort of doing whatever, using whatever speed that I built up in that dive, going for a bit of a vertical, and I do get saved there by that I-16. And this is something that you do have to make sure you avoid in the P-51s. You have to make sure that you prioritize your targets. You have to make sure that you still have enough energy left because this thing bleeds a lot of speed in turns and is a big fat boy. So you've just got to play it properly. You can't be an absolute lemon about it. And that's kind of what I was like here, but I still got away with it. And you might wonder why and how, and the answer is quite simple, a numbers advantage. If you can swoop in, pick up one, maybe crit another, maybe kill a third, and you have enough teammates around you that are also doing the same thing, you can very easily overwhelm your opponents to the point where it is an unfair fight. The Mustang Mark 1A prides itself on boom and zoom, and it prides itself on being able to store its energy in a climb 
and use that in a dive, opening up with 20 mils, getting a quick burst in, and then jetting off to safety. And that's the key with this plane. It's extremely simple, and yet it's very, very uncommon, and you might wonder why that is. And I would say that one of the main reasons is patience. It is difficult to play this game patiently, and that's one thing that a lot of new players need to figure out very quickly, otherwise they'll find themselves in situations that do not benefit them very rapidly. And that's exactly what's happened to the Canon Stang earlier, that's what happened to the A36, the BF109, the Focke Wolf 190, and the P63s. Everyone's finding themselves in situations where they don't have the energy to compete, and the Russian planes that naturally climb better are going to end up with a better result. And you might think, well, that might be Russian bias, but no, it's just playing the plane wrong. The P63A here is also playing his plane wrong, not pulling off after a head-on, but of course, you know, most of this can be kind of forgiven, because I would assume that these players are somewhat novices. But this goes to show that when you are learning War Thunder, there are several important things that you need to consider. You may need to make sure that you climb, you need to make sure that you don't fully commit to head-ons, you need to assume that your enemy is running stealth belts all the time. These are things that you will only learn with experience or by watching YouTube content like you are now. This P63 is also in the same boat, sitting at basically sea level, and I have heaps of speed, heaps of altitude to play with. Um, I am just going to go for a cheeky head-on, and the reason is because he's the last guy left, practically. Um, but also, there's nothing more to it. This guy's fully committing, uh, and that's pretty much all she wrote. A very, very simple six kill game, and all I did was get the high ground. Once you get the high ground, it's pretty much all over, and that's all I can say for the P51 Mustang. It's really, really surprising how easily that works, and we're going to kind of demonstrate that again with this match here. Whilst this plane is not a good climber, it's still good enough, but you can also meet a lot of your enemies at this altitude and not really have a problem. As long as you are the highest one there, then it doesn't really matter. Again, we're on the same map, it's a similar situation. The Focke Wolf 190 sets the A36 on fire, and that's fine. We've got a couple of enemy planes that are sort of trundling in, uh, and I'm just going to just sort of leisurely climb towards them. I don't want to do an aggressive climb, because this plane needs a bit of speed. It doesn't really accelerate that well. It does in a dive, but certainly not in a straight line. And the J22 is extremely formidable if you get into a turning engagement with it. So I need to make sure that I don't. I'm going to go for a quick head-on, uh, get a kill there quite nicely. The I-16 and the P-51 here are my biggest threats. And this is what I've done. I haven't side-climbed properly, I haven't gone and gotten my altitude properly, and I can potentially pay the price for that very, very quickly. This I-16 is unaware, and that is my saving grace. He's aware at the very last second, and of course these things are very slow, so I'm just going to spray away, get some uh, shots on target, and I barely escaped from that with my life, and it's really, really risky doing this sort of stuff. I'm not playing the plane properly at all, but how am I getting away with it? I am basically using the guns. The guns are the saving grace, and the cannon thing here is coming in. He's got the altitude advantage, and he is very, very easily able to snap onto my 6. I have a Kai-61 behind me. It's looking really, really dire, and this could very, very easily turn south. The Kai-61 just needs to land a hit on my engine, and I am done for. There's a P-51 sitting behind me, but unfortunately for him, he gets set on fire by a friendly, and there are several enemies that are potentially threats for later on. The Kai-61 pulls off, and this is where I get my saving grace. Like, I would have been completely dead if there weren't four allied players able to chase this guy away. You need to get your altitude. It's plain and simple. Now, I'm going to come and return the favor. The P-51 has flown un underneath me. Um, unfortunately for the Kai-61, he has put himself in a bit of a shit situation here. And I'm going to just fire away, try and get some shots on target. It looks like he is pretty damaged. Uh, but, you know, I feel a little bit of a personal vendetta towards that Kai-61 for chasing me all the way down. And so he can have some 20 mils. The P-51 is now on the back foot as well. And it looks like he's just sort of uh, really struggling. He's got a Spitfire, he's got a Focke Wolf, and he now has me to deal with. So it's uh, really, really looking bad for this P-51. I managed to butcher all of my shots, but I'm pretty confident that that guy's going to go down like a sack of bricks very, very shortly. P61, that is another very spooky plane. I'm going to go for a quick cheeky head on. I get a critical hit there and no fire, which means that I have to give chase to a P61, which will uh, probably have that 20mm turret up. 
I really want to be careful of that 20 mil turret. I don't really want to engage it, but it looks like he's maneuvering the plane, so you can't, you know, you can't really maneuver the plane and use the turret at the same time. So I'm going to quickly saw off his wing while I have the chance, and that leaves me with eight shells and a uh, fairly quick rapid fire match. There's pretty much not more else to this. It's uh, fairly straightforward. If you can have your team around you, you can get yourself some fairly quick kills. But of course, what happens when your team abandons you? You simply need the high ground, and there's absolutely no way, in any way, shape, or form, that the high ground is going to be a disadvantage to you. You could probably be at 6,000 meters, and it would still be an advantage. Uh, but at the end of the day, BF109G is coming in, and it looks like we're in a bit of an up tier. 3.3 to 4.3, that's about as high as it goes. ME410B, ME uh, ME uh, I only just realized how much of a stupid engagement that was, but it's fine, we're moving on, we got the kill. G2 Tropical is our next target. I, because the BF109 has so much energy, I'm just gonna try and sneak around and do a rolling scissors, get myself a cheeky kill, because at the, uh, if the BF109 makes a single mistake, it's pretty much all over for him. And if I can nose around in time, uh, I will get myself a very, very easy kill, but it's really, really difficult. You can just see how fat the P51 is at those low speeds. The BF109G has so much energy though but that he's very, very close to completely overshooting me and absolutely butchering it. He probably should have gone vertical here, but judging by the way that this is going, it's probably going to go south for him very, very quickly. And there he goes. His left wing is very, very damaged and he's spiraling down to the ground. And this is very, very lucky for me. I could have been very, very poorly off. Uh, it could have gone quite south. The BF-109 had quite an energy advantage on me. He just chose to squander it, and that is the only reason why I came out of that. So if you are looking for the high ground, we now have it, and it's quite simple. It's super easy to exploit. We're going to dive in a little bit. That 2001 is coming close, so I'm just going to sort of uh, jiggle a little bit, move out of the way. The 410, I think he's going for AI. Really, really dumb. But either way, the 2001 is starting to pitch up, but... We have so much energy over this guy that all I have to do is roll back around and pick my timing to come right back down on him. And you can see that the 2001 is just really, really struggling. He's going to pitch up, but there's nothing you can do against 420mm cannons, even if you have 151s. So with that done, we're going to head back towards the last straggler that was heading away. Uh, and there comes the SM92. We're at four kills. This is a small lobby. If I can get this guy and the next guy, I've practically got the entire enemy team. And all from getting the high ground, climbing a little bit, and not sitting at sea level, which is kind of insane when you think about it. Like, you can kill a whole enemy team just if you get above them. Think about that for a second. and Just, just think about the gravity of that. Think about how easily you can win a match. And speaking of winning a match, the SM92 is a fat boy. And so he has a much lower chance of winning a dogfight against me. But I do need to be careful because he's got a lot of energy, he's come from above, and whilst he's completely squandered all of his advantage, I need to make sure that I get my shots off in time, and I don't waste my ammunition. So the SM92 also has a turret, I've got to be really careful of that, but you can just see how quickly this SM92 is is spinning around. It's, it's pretty good for a twin engine fighter, but at the end of the day, I'm just able to keep up, and I'm able to saw that wing off, get myself a cheeky little ace. That being said, this plane, you are, uh, like, I can't believe how lucky I am. This, this is a really, really lucky match. Uh, but at the end of the day, by using the plane properly, you ultimately exploit all of their weaknesses and you mitigate some of yours. So being at altitude, winning that dogfight, that crucial, crucial dogfight against the BF-109 has allowed me to exploit the rest of the enemy team and absolutely slaughtered the shit out of them. This would have been a loss otherwise. You can see the last remaining guy on my team is a B-25. B-25 players... Uh, still still bomber dads, don't worry, I was there at that point at uh, some stage. But at the end of the day, we've turned a loss into a potential win uh, quite quickly too. This is the type of gameplay that really escapes most early War Thunder players. You'll find that as you start to sort of learn how to play the game, you'll realize that altitude and boom and zoom and playing somewhat conservatively is really, really important. Of course, there are times where you play conservatively like where I was against the 2001. But there are also times where you play really aggressively, which was against that G2 Tropical. 
these are the engagements that you have to sort of decide where you're going to take your steps. You have to make sure that you make the right decision. And of course, that does come with time and experience, but you can kind of figure it out. If you think about it nice and logically, if you are in an advantage, why would you do anything to squander that advantage? Why would you bleed energy? Why would you turn? Why would you be reckless? Unless you've got such a safety net behind you like I did in the first game, there's really no reason to. So continue to boom and zoom. If you are in a disadvantage and you need to make that advantage very, very clear, you can do some things. Obviously, not, not all things, but you can definitely do a couple of little things here and there to make yourself an advantage. It's difficult. It almost didn't happen several times in this video, but because I had teammates, because I had a backup plan, because I had altitude, I was able to do a couple of things. I was able to head towards the, my team. I was able to head to the, the deck. I was able to do things. And the P-51 can facilitate that as long as you get the guns on target and as long as you get the altitude advantage. So ladies and gents, that'll do it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to keep